At the London 2012 Paralympics, judo hopeful Jack Hodgson was in the crowd watching visually impaired athletes take to the mat. For someone who had relatively recently been told by doctors that he wouldn't be able to do sport due to the progressive loss of his eyesight, those 2012 games meant a lot. Fast forward to now and Hodgson is a British Paralympian having competed out in Rio in 2016 himself and he's now gearing up for the IBSA Judo World Championships which begin on November the 16th out in Odivelas in Portugal. However, the lead up to these championships have been far from smooth for Hodgson after he underwent elbow surgery a couple of months ago. In his words, he shouldn't really be going, but British judo have maintained their faith in one of their more experienced athletes. A severe injury such as that is something that's very hard to cope with when you have to watch everyone else getting on the mat and you are unable to train in the way you'd like to. It hit Hodgson harder than he thought it would. But in the short term and the long term, he is driven by one determined thought. To beat anyone and everyone he faces on the mat. Jack, it is a very warm welcome to the podcast. Um, obviously, it's been a very busy day um, down here in, in Walsall uh, with media requests left, right and centre. But first off, how are you doing uh, on this busy, busy day? I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad. Um, quite enjoying it, actually. Yeah, it's been a lot, a lot of guys, BBC, uh, the BJA, the university, you know, quite a few people interested in talking to you. Not sure why, but <laughs> there we are. <laughs> well, let's find out why we're all interested in talking to you, I suppose. Um, so obviously we're all uh, here, as I've mentioned before, um, because you've been picked as part of the British team for the IBSA 2018 World Judo Championship, which takes place in Portugal from the 16th to the 18th of November. What does that mean to you? Um, as someone who's been to a Paralympics before, to get called up to a championship like that? Oh, well, it's, uh, it's nice to see that you still have faith in me, I suppose. Um, but, I mean, it does, mean actually, it does actually mean a lot to me because I, I shouldn't really be going. I got I had an operation a couple of months ago. Uh, so my injury time, really, realistically, was six months. And, you know, it's only been three months down the line now. So to actually get the call up to be, you know, you can go, it means a lot. What was the injury? I had, a, I had a surgery on my elbow uh, from which complete reconstruction. I grade three tore everything. Which strikes me as quite important to have that working if you want to do judo properly. Yeah, it does. <laughs> but, I mean, we've, had, we've got some fantastic medical team, and there's, you know, support team and the coaching staff here. have done everything they can. And myself, we've, done, we've all done everything that we can to make sure that it's in maybe not quite tip-top shape, but good enough shape. Exactly. So how do, what does that mean to you then that they've, despite the injury problems, they've stuck by you? And, that, and they believe in your ability. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that's what I mean. That's what I was trying to say. Like, it's just, it's really great to show they still have that faith, and they go, you know what? He is still our best chance at going. We still believe that he can go and get a medal because everyone's going out for a medal. No one goes out just to step on the mat. Mm-hmm. So, the fact they they show that they still think I can get a medal. I mean, mm-hmm. that's good. And obviously, the date today is the 24th of October, so we've got less than a month until the World Championships start. Less than a month. How is preparation going for it, away from the injury side? Uh, preparation is interesting, because it's, it's the first time I've ever, had, I've ever had to prepare for a competition injured, so I can't do the training on the mat the same as the other guys would. So I did my first uh, proper session yesterday, so less than a month out from the World Championships. And before that, I've not really done any judo in like four months. Yeah. So it's uh, not, but off the mat, that's when I can do different type of preparation, like my gym, um, you know, my diet, my nutrition, the the psychology side of things, the physio side of things. That's all been top jaw. Mm-hmm. Like, with all that stuff, we've been able to push it a lot further than we'd normally be able to because of you know the time constraints. So that's all been. Good. Exactly. I mean, you talk to other people who in uh, different sports who may have had injuries like that. Mm. Is there a little bit of, I don't know, do you feel a little bit left out that you can't take part in what you, the yeah, normal you type do. of training? It is, it is really mentally hard for me, especially because, you know, all the guards are going away. They went to uh, Kazakhstan for a week, Japan for two weeks. So I've almost been left by myself at the centre for three weeks. And it is, a, it is a mentally tough time. You've got to push yourself through it without, without really having anyone to go, come on, because we are quite 
we are a team that encourages each other. We all train together, we all live together pretty much. I mean, Scal got a house together. Um, so, so a lot of the time we spent together. So just taking all that away all of a sudden, it, 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 it hit me harder than I thought it would. Mm -hmm. I struggled more to keep, to keep going and to get out of bed in the mornings I would. So I am really grateful for having the team around the rest of the year. Yeah. How is it now then? Because I pr presume then, if, that, if it hit you harder than you thought it would, do you think you've maybe come out a little bit stronger now that you're on the mend? Yeah, I think so. I've come back on the mat a lot more, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word for it. I'd say determined is yeah, what determined, I would think. Yeah, yeah, I, I've got more fight in me. I come on the mat and I just want to scrap with people. I just want to fight. I've not, I've not been able to fight for like four months and that is my job. So I love it. Mm -hmm. I love having a scrap. So you, cut, you come on here and you really, and you know, I feel stronger. I'm, but that, the whole time I was injured, that's what I was saying in my head. I want to come back like a harder fighter. I want to come back stronger. Everyone says that, but I really wanted to. So, you know, just in the past few weeks, you know, I've been doing judo again. I can feel that I'm gripping stronger. Um, I've been a bit more of a bully on the mat, which is what you know me and my coach have spoke about. Exactly. Um, so we'll turn back the clock a little bit um, and look at essentially how you got into the sport in the first place. Because I yep. think I'm right in saying that you grew up on an RAF base, yes. if that is true. And that you basically had a choice of judo and ballet yes. to pick from. Why judo for you? Well, I imagine your viewers can't see what I look like, but I'm a big dude. I'm away 140 <laughs> kilos. Ballet was not the sport for me. But no, basically there was just, there was, yeah, there was them two clubs and there was nothing else to do in Northern Ireland on an RAF base as a young child. So wherever I went to that club and everywhere that I moved there on, there just seemed to be, always be a judo club nearby. Um, so we just kept going there, kept making pals and I started doing all right for myself. I started winning a few competitions at you know, mainstream events, got into like the mainstream English team, did a few international events, competed for Great Britain as a 12, 13 year old. And then when I started losing my eyesight, we just sort of naturally progressed onto the visually impaired team as mm -hmm. what is it actually like then growing up on an IF base because I always imagine them as like tiny little communities in a town somewhere because you've got I presume you have a little shop here and there and then everyone yeah, sort you know, of knows you know, each other one shop like a spa or I think it was called a NAFI in Germany it stands for like Navy Army Air Force something mm -hmm. like that so you have one one little shop it's normally a pub or something and like you said it's just a small community all the guys we all know each other um you, know, you walk down the street and you just you, you know that guy's your dad's pal in the army but there's not a lot of kids around you the majority of the kids at the school you go to are army kids so you don't really get away from it but it was, it was a good it was a good area to grow up in it teaches you respect it teaches you you know your you know you know what i mean like it teaches you how to be a proper adult and all that so it's a great it's not like, it was nice area. Mm -hmm. and you briefly alluded to there is when you start start losing your sight mm -hmm. How important was having judo as something to fall back on to help you cope with that? Well, at the time, I never, I never like, in my wildest dreams imagined that I would be doing judo full-time. It, it wasn't something that I planned to do. Well, did you think it might stop you from doing all sorts of sports? Kind of. I mean, the guy... So when I went to the doctors originally, she, the doctor said to me, oh, you can't ride your bike anymore, you can't do judo, you can't go running anymore, or anything like that. So that kind of hit me hard, and I was a bit, a bit down for a while, but... You know, when you realise, I went to the 2012 games and they had the Paralympic judo there. I was like, these guys are doing it and they're visually impaired, so why can't I? So that's, that kind of just spurred that on. And from, from them onwards, uh, I went with Ian, the coach, our coach now, and he actually got employed here. So it was like, oh, well, we kind of knew each other before, so it was just natural that we were going to bring each other in the team. So it all, it all worked out in the end. That, that's quite an interesting one because you're one of quite a few guests we've had on now who've looked back at those 2012 games in London and that's been the trigger for them to suddenly take their sport up to the next level. Mm. But was, that, was that easy for you to kind of go, hang on, I want, I want to be these guys on yeah, the map? Yeah, I mean, 2012 was on something called the Paralympic Inspiration Programme, which I don't know if you've heard of before, but mm -hmm. basically the Paralympic guys to bring a bunch of people who potentially could go in the future, but they might not, but they might... They might progress into it because so I was good. I was quite good in my sport, and I was losing my eyesight. So that like, two and two together, he might be all right. So that they took us on that. And they showed us around the village. They showed. They took us to the events. That was obviously the first time I've really watched or even experienced the games. I mean, most Olympians say as a kid they watched it, but I couldn't. I didn't really watch it. Um, once I was that interested in, but then once when I saw it all at 2012, it's yeah, you're right. Something triggered, and you're like, this could be all right. I could do this. 
this looks like it could be fun. Exactly. So then once that moment happens then, yeah. how, is it a case of coming up to here and, and getting an opportunity here at the uh, Judo Centre of Excellence? This ju- Judo Centre is about four years old now. I've, well, maybe five years old. I've lived here for four four years. But before that, it was uh, all over the country. There was a centre down in Dartford, which is a long, long way from where I was. But we used to travel down maybe once a month because you know, parents working, school commitments and all that. But... No, you are right now. It's a case of just get yourself down here if, if you do it, and it's the best place to do judo in the country, hands it, down. Exactly, yeah. Does does judo bring the best out of you? Judo brings the best and worst out in anyone. <laughs> it's a fighting sport, so you get you, you brings out that aggression, that anger, the you, your arousal levels go through the roof. So you really it brings out it all, and it makes you so emotional when you can't do something, something frustrated. And there's been some moments where you know you, you see people storm off the mat. You've been You've been sent off the mat. Everyone's been sent off the mat once or twice, or just for that. But then also at the same time, the flip side of that, it brings out the, uh, the humility in each other. It brings out the friendship. And, you know, when me and, me and Scale walk home after absolutely battering each other all night, you, you feel closer than ever because you're just like, that was a good session. You fought well tonight. And it's a, it's a strange one to say that fighting brings you together, but it does. It does bring out the best and worst in everyone. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, did, I mentioned myself briefly. I, I did fencing when I was younger and it's the same kind of thing where you end up spending most of the training session trying to hit each other yeah, exactly. <laughs> and damage each other but then you will go home and be you friends come afterwards. come out with a handshake and a bow. That's what yeah, exactly. Um, following the 2012 Paralympics and then you made your Paralympic debut in 2016 at Rio. First off, how much work went into that? Because did you ever imagine that you'd be no. at the next one no, when you were there in 2012? Absolutely not. After 2012, I started doing judo a lot more. I moved to my new club, which is, uh, well, not a club now, but I, I still affiliate with the club. It's Grimsby Judo Club in, well, Grimsby, obviously. But, so I moved down there, and that is probably the top-notch club to, to train in if you're in the Lincolnshire area. So I moved down there, and, and that just raises your level up a step. And then work, knowing John Z from Scunthorpe, I'm from Gaines, but only about 20 minutes apart. So to knowing him, he kind of was breathing down my shoulder the whole time like like come on come on you've got it you've got it you've got to do it i mean it was a pretty pretty wasn't until about 2014 early early 2015 i was like i'm actually doing all right i'm on the ranking list i was about fifth or sixth at the time i've won a few fights i've got a couple of medals and when we had that shit down he went jack you could actually go to the games you're in a qualifying spot and then i actually finished third in the world that, that year my first cycle so that was uh, beyond anything I expected or probably anyone expected of me. A lot of the time we often focus on the individual, but there's always a team, be it coaches, mm. be it family, there in the background. Yeah, well, um, without, without them, I'd genuinely say I would not be here. I know it's a really cliche thing to say, but I am inherently quite lazy, so I do need <laughs> a kick up the, uh, the bum quite a few times. When you go out to then Brazil for the Paralympics, mm. it, was it everything you expected or was it totally different? The thing is, uh, we have quite a lot of recon trips, so we, we going up to the games, and the same will be to Tokyo. We, we've already, we went out to Rio and Brazil, we must have gone out about 10 times. So by the time you actually get to the games, there's nothing new, it's not the sparkling lights, and she, every, it's not the same as you always imagine, but you're quite, you're quite used to it by the time you get out there. But when you actually get there and it hits you, I'm at the games. I've actually made it to the to the game. This is what all the work's been for. There is a moment where you're, the whole team just looks at each other in a bit of disbelief. And the coach goes, right, stop it, go to bed. It's time for action. Time, yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Go to bed, wake up the next day. And then after that, after that, once it's all over, then you can have your fun and go and, go, uh, and experience the massive food hall and <laughs> stuff like that. Exactly. Uh, in, terms of, <laughs> in terms of performance, I think memory serves me right in that you just missed out on a bronze medal match um, yeah, at the Games. I, yeah, I lost, I lost um, what's called a rapid charge fight. So I lost my first fight against uh, Japanese Masaki, who I've since beat. But I lost him at the games, and then I had I won my second, and then the third fight was probably the best fight, one of my best fights in my career against an old Olympic champion, or not Olympic, Paralympic champion. And we went to the full time, and it was just one shido in it, and that's that makes all the difference in a in a sport like judo at the time. Yeah. Did it make you hungry for more? I'm always hungry, but yeah, it did make me hungry for more. Definitely, I want to go out and just beat him. I want to beat him. I want to beat everyone. 
Yeah. Is, is that now kind of the goal? Is just to, to beat everyone who just to stands in front of you? Like, if you stand in front of me on the mat, I want to beat you. That's that's mm-hmm. the end. That's the goal of it. You, no one goes out there going, oh, "I'd like to beat you," I mean, but I'm not too bothered. I mean, like, you, you want to win. Mm-hmm. But you, you we right. we focus on that a little bit um, on this podcast because mental determination obviously comes a lot easier to some people than it does to others. You know, in terms of the work you have to put in yeah. and the training you have to put in, sometimes it's a lot easier just to stare at the cake in the fridge and eat the cake yes. rather I'm, than I'm, go. I'm a heavyweight, so the, <laughs> oh, the, the cake one. naturally <laughs> draws to me. Exactly. It's, is it easy to stay on top of everything and try and keep determined when when you might be feeling knackered and you don't want to? actually you know have to pull no, yourself up no I don't, I don't i don't think it is actually obviously it is a bit but i'm not i'm not convinced it is a trait that you inherently have i think you've got to train and be you can learn and, it and you've got to yeah you can learn it definitely I, I i know from experience i go through stages when i'm on it i'm hot on it and i'll do everything and i go through another month and i look back at that month and I go why why did i make that decision you know to to do one rep less than I should have done. Why did I say that I did five when I only did four reps? And you think, I regret doing that. So you've got, you, everyone does that. Everyone makes a mistake. You've really got to just remember, just just do it. Just At the time it might be hard work, but it'll all be worth it. No one has trained as hard as you if you always do, if you do everything. Exactly. Um, this is something that Evan alluded to while I was t- um, talking to him. And the fact that you get to train with the Olympic um, judo representatives as well. Does that really bring the best out of every single one of you? I think, yeah, I think it brings out the, it brings out the best on us because we get to fight with top notch fighters. You know, the, the Paralympics is great, but the Paralympics is quite a small community in Britain. So most of the Paralympic fighters are here at the centre. There's not a huge, a lot, you know, it's not many of them out there. So if we couldn't do that, we'd be nowhere near as good as a team as we could do. And it also brings out the best in the Olympic team. They get to see, they get to look at the Paralympic team and think these guys. These guys can't see, they can't hear, and yet they're, they're just coming out here and fighting and doing what they do. So I'd like to think that we inspire them as much as they inspire us. Looking ahead now, back to the, the World Championships next month, um, what happens between now and you actually getting out there in terms of training? In terms of training, I've just got to get on the match as much, much as my injury allows me to. If I can get on every day, I'd like to do that. If I can't, I'll be down in the gym instead doing some extra sessions it's just all go from now there's no we're not in a position where we can slack off for the last month we've got to go mm, but yeah and bearing in mind what's happened to you recently have you set yourself any kind of target um for the world championships or is it a case of just seeing how it no. goes um I, I, there's not much pressure on me put it that way there's not much pressure on me my, i've always got an individual target in my head i always want to i, I always want the metal mm-hmm. I'm probably harder on myself than anyone is on, on me. So if I, if, we don't, if I don't get the medal, I'll be a bit upset. But at the end of the day, just being on the world is a massive privilege to me. And, uh, you know, like I said, just for them to show the faith in me to put me on that stage is a, a massive honour. Yeah, and you say there's no pressure on you. Do, are you someone who usually puts pressure on yourself? Or yeah, do I put you a lot of pressure it? on myself. I, I, always, I always try to make myself do more than I should be able to. I always want to beat the guy that I shouldn't be able to beat. I think that's both a positive and negative attribute because it means that I, I, should, I always thrive for more success but then at the same time I always, I'm always a lot harder on myself than I should be. Mm-hmm. So it's a bit of a two uh, double-sided sword. Yeah, exactly. And long-term goals, I imagine 2020 must be there in the forefront of your mind. Yeah, yeah. I'd be absolutely looking forward to it. Um, I want to be there more than anything, so I hope I'll be there. That's all I can say. <laughs> what do you think then, be it training, be it your, your mental frame of mind, what do you think you learnt from going to something like the Paralympics in 2016? You come, you come away from the Paralympics. Well, I came away from the Paralympics feeling happy but with a tinge of regret because obviously I lost. I didn't do as well as I thought. You know, I, I was smiling, but at the same time, I had a couple of tears down my face. So it was a, it was a difficult, it was a weird emotion for me. I didn't... I didn't really know how to respond to it, but I came away from it thinking, I, I need to do that again. You know, you learn that you just want to do it again and again and again, mm-hmm. and hopefully one day come away with a nice shiny gold. Is, and we, we hope that day comes, comes true as well. Um, for, for anyone who, who might be thinking, this is kind of your opportunity to sell your sport a little bit. Yeah. Um, for anyone you know, who might be looking for a sport to, whether it's mental struggles or whatever as a stress release, why is judo or sport in general such a good avenue to go down? Well, it's, 
there's, there's so much research out there that shows that sport is the, the way to go if you're well, pretty much cured so much. But judo especially, you just if you want to scrap with someone, come do judo. If you don't want to scrap with someone and you just want to learn technique, come do judo. You know what I mean? There's, there's, I've been to the adaptive uh, knees competition recently as a as a special guest, and it was really eye-opening to see. Like we think we have it hard sometimes with the, as a Paralympic team. There's, you know, there's guys there with one leg. There's guys there doing judo who you know have Down syndrome or severe learning disability. And you're like, these guys can do it. So why can't you know Joe Bloggs off the street who uh, is thinking, oh, should I do sport? And those guys are so inspirational. They make you want to get out of bed. Yeah. I'm a Paralympian, I, I see those guys just doing what they do, going through the struggle that they've gone through and think, Jesus, I can do more. Exactly. And, but then you look at those guys and seeing what they can do, but then there's probably people looking at you. They probably, and, yeah, and I mean, they, they, probably look, they probably look at us and I'm sure people, and we all, look, we all look at each other, but that's what sport does. It brings everyone together. It, brings, it doesn't matter if you've got a severe learning disability or you can't see very well or you're an Olympic champion. Everyone, everyone gets treated with the same respect when you walk through a dojo. Everyone bows on the same mat towards the same coaches. And when you're fighting each other, you shake hands, you bow to each other again, you don't say, well done. Yeah, and it's all about that respect, isn't it? Exactly. That's, mm-hmm. that's what, I think that's what judo teaches everyone so well. Exactly. And that's a, that's a perfect way to, to bring this interview to a close. And uh, thank you so much again um, for coming on to the podcast and obviously telling, telling us all about your own story. And we wish you very well once the World Championships come thank around, as well as the recovery from the injury as well, because that's not a nice thing to, to have to no, go no. through. Um, but thank you so much. Cheers. Thanks for having us. Thank you for listening to this latest judo special. You can subscribe to Sportspiel on podcast platforms everywhere and find out more about us on our website, sportspielonline.com. You can listen back to our last special ahead of the IBSA World Judo Championships with Evan Malloy. And don't forget to follow us on social media. We are on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and all of our handles are Pod. Myself and Will are going to be back with our next full-length episode, that will be episode 31, in a week's time on November the 18th. Details of who our sporting guest will be will follow in due course, but until next time, listeners, thank you for tuning in, and we will see you very soon.